1893, the British Royal Navy considered the Mediterranean Sea very important because it was a key route between Britain and India. They were worried about potential threats from the navies of France and Italy. To protect this route, they gathered a strong naval force, making the Mediterranean fleet one of the most powerful in the world. On June 22, 1893, most of this fleet, including 11 powerful ships, eight battleships, and three large cruisers, was doing its yearly training exercises near Tripoli, which is in modern-day Lebanon. This training was crucial to keeping the fleet prepared and effective. But this training led to one of the worst shipwrecks of all time, and what was recently discovered inside the shipwreck has terrified the whole world. Join us as we dig deeper into this insane shipwreck, one that has the possibility for disaster even today. Vice Admiral Sir George Tryon, the Commander-in-Chief of the Mediterranean Fleet, had a strict and disciplined approach to training his crews. He believed that the key to keeping his sailors sharp and efficient was continuous fleet exercises. Before the era of wireless communication, these exercises relied on signal flags, semaphore, and signal lamps to convey orders. Tryon introduced a new system of ship handling called the TA system. The TA system, which stands for Turn Away, was designed to allow complex maneuvers with few signals involved. When the TA flag was raised, all ships were expected to follow the flagship's movements without waiting for further instructions. Tryon believed that continuous fleet exercises based on such innovative systems were critical to keeping his sailors safe, no matter what happened. That's the opposite of Navy training. So no wonder it ended up causing major problems in implementation. In June 1893, Vice Admiral Sir George Tryon led the Mediterranean fleet in annual training exercises. Attempting a risky turning maneuver near Beirut, he proposed narrowing the gap between two columns to 400 yards. Despite officer concerns and initial plans for a safer distance, Tryon, aboard HMS Victoria, insisted on six cables at 1,000 meters. That's way too close for comfort. At 15 o'clock, the maneuver was ordered, lacking a pre-established code. The intricate turning with the phrase preserving the order of the fleet heightened collision risks. This signaled that the starboard column's order would be maintained, increasing the danger. This meant that the relative positions of the ships would be maintained and they would essentially swap places without any rearrangement. The Royal Navy suggested that it is also possible that Tryon might have meant for one of the divisions to actually turn outside the other. Starting with the two columns one 200 yards apart, an outside turn with a turning circle of 800 yards would have left them at 400 yards apart after completing the maneuver. This particular approach would have required the two columns to turn at different times or at different speeds rather than simultaneously at the same speed. Lord Guilford, Tryon's flag lieutenant, signaled the fatal order for both divisions to turn 16 points inwards, even though it was clear this wasn't the way to go here. Despite some officers being aware of Vice Admiral Sir George Tryon's plans, none objected. Rear Admiral Markham, who led the other column, was hesitant to raise the flag signal, indicating that he understood the risky order. Tryon, noticing the delay and realizing the fleet was approaching the shore and needed a quick turn, asked Markham via a semaphore signal. What are you waiting for? Markham immediately ordered his column to begin turning. Several officers from the two flagships later confirmed that they had hoped that Tryon would issue an order at the last minute, saving them from disaster. But the columns kept turning towards each other. It was only a few seconds before the actual collision that the captains of both ships realized what was going on. Even then, they waited for permission before taking action that could have avoided the collision, although that was the opposite of how they were trained to work. Morris Burke, who was Tryon's flag captain, had even asked Tryon three times for permission to order the engines astern, but waited till he actually had permission to do anything. At the last moment, Tryon yelled across to Markham, Go astern! Go astern! But it was too late. Everyone was scared and confused and couldn't act in time to save the ship. By the time both captains ordered the engines on their respective ships to be reversed, it was too late. The ram of Camperdown struck the starboard side of Victoria about 12 feet below the waterline and penetrated 9 feet into the ship. 
The engines were left turning, which meant that the ram ended up getting withdrawn and letting in more seawater before all the watertight doors on Victoria could be closed. Two minutes after the collision, the ships began moving apart. On that hot Thursday afternoon, traditionally a rest time for the crew, all hatches and means of ventilation were open to cool the ship. Even though there was a literal 100-square-foot hole in the side of the ship open to the sea, Tryon and his navigation officer, Staff Commander Thomas Hawkins Smith, didn't even believe the ship could sink. Tryon ordered the ship to turn and head for the shore five miles away, hoping to beach her. Surrounding ships had launched boats for a rescue, but Tryon signaled for them to turn back. Two minutes after Camperdown backed out of the hole, water ended up well over the deck and spilling into the open hatches. Lieutenant Herbert Heath went with some people and attempted to unroll a collision mat down the side of the ship. That would allow them to patch the hole and slow the inrush of water by a lot, but they were forced to abandon the attempt when they found themselves standing in water before they could position the mat. Five minutes after the collision, the bow had already sunk 15 feet and the ship was heavily listening to starboard. Water started coming through all of the gun ports. Despite the engine room still being manned and the engines running, hydraulic power for the helm failed, making it impossible to turn the ship, and there was no power to launch the ship's boats. Eight minutes after the collision, the entire fore end of the ship was underwater, and water was lapping the main deck. The stern got to the point that the screws were pretty much out of the water. Captain Burke went below to investigate the damage and closed the watertight doors right after the initial collision happened. Even though the engine room was dry, things were different in the front of the ship. Some men had been washed away by incoming water, while others were trapped behind closed doors. Yet there wasn't enough time to close up the ship to stop the water from spreading. Burke returned to the deck and ordered the men to fall in. The assembled ranks of sailors were instructed to turn to face the side and then abandon ship. Victoria capsized 13 minutes after the collision, rotating to starboard with a loud crash and tossing her boats and anything free to the side. Any, uh, 60. Water coming in through the funnels caused explosions when it reached the boilers. She slipped into the water with her keel uppermost, bow first, and her propellers continued to rotate endangering anyone nearby. The majority of the crew was able to abandon ship, but those in the engine room were drowned because they were never given orders to leave their positions. The ship's chaplain, Rev. S. D. Morris, R.N., was last seen attempting to rescue the sick. Morris worked tirelessly to save the sick and maintain discipline, eventually sinking with the vessel. Witnesses described a widening circle of foaming bubbles like a giant saucepan of boiling milk surrounding the wreck, discouraging rescue boats from approaching. The number of live men in the water steadily decreased and many were subjected to harrowing conditions such as powerful currents and swirling debris. Gunner Frederick Johnson, a survivor, reported being sucked down three times. Lieutenant Lauren, another survivor, described the chaotic scene as floating debris being thrown around with tremendous force resulting in a seething mass on the water's surface. Camperdown was also severely damaged, with her ram nearly wrenched off and flooding in her bows. The watertight doors on both ships had not been closed in time, which exacerbated the flooding. Of the crew, 357 were rescued, while 358 lost their lives in the tragic incident. Collingwood, responsible for providing a steam launch for the fleet that day, played a crucial role in rescuing survivors. Despite search efforts, only six bodies were recovered immediately after the sinking, and they were buried in a plot provided by the Sultan of Turkey, just outside Tripoli. The people were immediately taken to Malta. Commander John Jellicoe, the executive officer of Victoria, was among those rescued. Tryon stayed on top of the chart house as the ship sank. Hawkins Smith stayed right with him. Hawkins Smith survived, but described the force of the sinking and being entangled in the ship's rigging. He doubted that Tryon could have survived, considering Tryon less fit than himself. After a decade-long search, the wreck of HMS Victoria was discovered on August 22, 2004, by Lebanese-Austrian diver Christian Francis and British diver Mark Elliott. The wreck is now 460 feet deep, 
its bow and around 30 meters of its length buried, and its stern pointing directly upwards towards the surface. The discovery of intact ammunition inside the sunken ship was one of the craziest things about this whole ordeal. The ship was equipped with two 16.25-inch guns in a twin turret, marking them as the largest guns ever mounted on a British battleship at that time. The fact that the ammunition remains relatively preserved after more than a century underwater underscores the destructive potential these weapons still hold, yet they're now powerless. But could all of this really have been avoided if Tryon just followed the rules? Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos just like this. We'll see you in the next one!